grateful, as already been said, to be here in your presence, in this place you set aside for us, singing that song, Holy, 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 Amen. realizing, Lord, that that has been going on in heaven and will continue to be, and but one day it will come down here on earth when thy kingdom comes upon earth. And we will be then, Lord, in the position, the people you've always wanted us to be, really and really, and in the fullness as we have never known it. We thank you, Lord, for what hope we have, and we praise you tonight, Lord, that we have already a confirmation by the gift of the Holy Spirit, that token, Lord, given unto us. We cannot thank you enough for that, Lord, and we believe it, O oh God, and that's just where we stand. But our faith, Lord, looks up to you, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Help us as we study tonight, Lord, and may great good come from this service, not because of anything man has to say, Lord, but because of your word and the life in that word it just takes over our own lives until we are manifested as having been a part of that word and are still a part of that word, to be even more so that part of the word yet to come. We'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> now, uh, Sunday service, perhaps we might have a message, a Christmas message, I really don't know at this time, but we'll try to look forward to that, and then the coming Wednesday, of course, is Christmas, so there'll be no service, but the more I'm thinking of a uh, little get-together on the Saturday the 28th, the more I'm concerned that, uh, I don't care if we don't have a, that picture, we'd maybe like to see the uh, one we talked about, the... Uh, Operation Thunderbolt, we just have a preaching service and foot washing and communion, and uh, that would take care of the month of January, and also, you know that uh, we don't seem to uh, take New Year's services the way some people do, a midnight service, and continue on, so on. So that just might work out the best of all. And, of course, there may be folk coming in, I suppose there will be. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do tonight with the help of the Lord and it's got to be the help of the Lord because I'm just, you know, stepping out by some type of a faith to take the uh, sermon, the token. Now, there's about 12 or 13 uh, uh, right back there. Some of you kind of look together. It's not that important because I'm going to be slow with it and take my time. And we'll be starting on page 3. And Brother Brown says, Now solemnly, reverently, we approach the word. Now, I wish to read this morning Exodus, the 12th chapter, and beginning with the 12th verse, the 12 and 13 verses inclusive, and listen close now. And then, before communion tonight, read the 12th chapter of Exodus, the entire chapter, for just the 11th verse here is the getting ready for the journey and the communion before the journey. We want to approach this very reverently now, the 12th verse of the 12th chapter. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now you'll notice in there that at the time of the Exodus, that God particularly uh, puts himself in the position of judge, because he said, I will execute judgment. And not only judge, but execution. Usually a judge does not execute the law of the land, he simply <clears throat> uh, puts it forth and lets the people know what is right and what must follow, and then the power of the state takes over. So this is uh, where God is leading the people out in order to set up his kingdom and see how he's doing it. So God today is leading the people out, and you see the picture up there on the clouds, which Brother Brandon said definitely was the judge. And that's Revelation 12 and 1, I believe, somewhere, 1 and 12, I beg your pardon. <clears throat> and that, that types for this hour. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, of course, that's definitely true in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, chapter going on to 5, that we will not be uh, taken into the <clears throat> tribulation. May the Lord bless his holy word. Now, I want to take a text out of here, just one little five-letter word, token, token. I want to speak on the word or teach the Sunday school lesson on the word of a token. And the Bible said here, the blood shall be a token unto you, and we want to use the word token. 
Now we don't know when I watch the clock and when it gets time. Well, I got many, many scriptures written down here. So not, so not knowing that I won't be with you for a while. And how do we know that this won't be the last time that some of us will ever meet together? So let's try to approach it just as reverently. I know that it is hard. <clears throat> the Lord gave us a nice morning now for the service, just nice. Let's try to concentrate on everything that we speak of. So if there's anything in there <clears throat> that the Lord would want you to know, that it will be given to you. We don't stand here just to be seen. We never come here just so others could see what clothing we were wearing. We come here for one thing. As our brother prayed that prayer, we are here for to hear the word, the word coming to us. We want that because that, and that evidently must be the word, is the only thing that is going to mean anything to us. Now, that's something you have to think about. That everybody is looking for everything else but the word. And the word is what we should be looking for. And that is what's going to uh, do us the good. And of course, Brother Brandon said the message of the hour is always the word of promise. And it's manifested for that hour. So you can understand why he is saying what he has said there. The word coming to us. We want that because that is the only thing that is going to mean anything to us. What does God say about it? What does God intend to do? Are we a part of it? See, anything that is going to be substantial, anything that is going to help us. Now, <clears throat> that's really true. That's, we just take a look over here in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and you notice it says, verse 1, Now faith is a substanting, or the giving of substance. It's actually a little different from that in the original. It means to give a strong foundation to so that whatever is superimposed upon it can stand because it has what it takes to make it to stand. And you see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith, of course, is a revelation. And a revelation is simply the Word of God made clear and true and pertinent for you. So when he says here, <clears throat> that is going to give it substance, He's telling you that this will impart the faith which is required at this hour in order what God has presented to us may be ours. Because always by faith we are reaching for that which God has presented to us being available to us. So he said here, we want that because the word is the only thing that is going to mean anything to us. Anything that is going to be substantial. <clears throat> See? Now... Anything going to help us? Now, many people think that ministries are the great thing. But in the right throne, it's going to be said when people come, have we not prophesied in thy names, cast out devils, and, and done wonderful works, and spoken in tongues, and had wonderful gifts manifested, and raised the dead, everything else? He said, no, that doesn't profit you one little bit, see? So there's many things that people feel will profit them. But it isn't that at all. <clears throat> it's the Word of God. Because after all, the Word of God is the judge. It's the great, is, is the judge itself. So these, these words of Brother Branham are very, very powerful to us because of the background we have as a people who understand the message given us at the last day. Now he goes on saying, we are a dying people. That's true. All human beings are headed toward eternity. Well, that's right. As one person once said, right above your mere born to die. That is true. Death sets in at birth. We're on our way out. Of course, death really begins to set in when you're right around 20 years of age. You start heading downhill. Then it's very strange that you're going uphill for about 19 or 20 years. And if you live to be 100, then you're going downhill for 81 to 80. And that's quite a, that's quite a hill when you think it's just 20 miles high and 80 miles down. And... Uh, in other words, one side is a whole lot lower than the other. <clears throat> and that's the way life is. A person ought to realize uh, these things that are so very, very true. All human beings headed toward eternity. And that's right. Uh, we've got this much time to make our decisions on which way we're going to head. The road is before us. We can take either side we want to choose. That is the way he put Adam and Eve, and that is the way he puts us. Now, there again, you see, <clears throat> we're right back to Brother Brown's statement of the power of choice. And, of course, the power of choice lies within the soul. And you have that after the age of accountability, particularly, then it devolves upon you 
to make a choice. Until the age of accountability, Brother Bannon said the record goes on, but there's not much volume of noise on that record uh, that God is making to play back to you at the white throne for a chance if you should have to go there rather than be at the judgment seat with the bride and all. <clears throat> but you will be at the white throne even if you're judging. And he said, then the noise and the static really begins to appear after a certain age, which be the age of accountability. So, all right, every one of us were born to the position of having to be accountable to God, whether we want to be accountable or not. <clears throat> See, that's what they brought up to Paul in the, in the ninth chapter of Romans, where he mentions the fact that uh, God said, For this cause that I raised up Pharaoh. So then it's not of him that uh, willeth or him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. He said, I will compassionate whom I will compassionate. And he said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. <clears throat> and then they said, Why then doth God yet find fault? Nay, but who are you, O man, that replies against God? Amen. See, people say, Well, I, I don't think that, that this really is the fair way to have things where, where God's got us on the spot. Well, that's, that's very great. Why don't you go to the boss and say, I don't think uh, we should be on the spot. Well, you go to your steward. He goes to the, goes to the union uh, <clears throat> president and goes right to the Supreme Court, maybe. And, and he might get some satisfaction. But you try to get it with God. Most people just don't realize the sovereignty is sovereignty. Amen. You know, <clears throat> it's really a case of uh, put up and shut up. Or shut up and put up, whichever you want to put it. Because it, that's what the Bible said, who are you to reply against God? Put up and shut up, right? Amen. Sounds slangy, but it's the truth. You see, I don't think God would say that. Well, God did say it. Amen. And I'm saying it for God, because that's what Paul said. Only I'm using vernacular, a little bit slummy. But I don't have any problem there, because I'm sort of a slum gullion myself, you know. <clears throat> All right. He puts us to the choice, and he says it's in the soul where the choice is. All right. Now, we must remember that no matter what we do or how successful we are in life, without Christ, we have totally lost everything. And that's true. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things are added unto you. So therefore, if you missed the first precept, you missed it all. Remember the rich young ruler. Remember Brother Branham used that in leadership, <clears throat> where he talked to the rich young ruler that Jesus loved him, and he said, sell all you have, give to the poor, and take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say take up your cross, but that's part of it. And the rich young man had too much money. That was too big of a cross. Now he came to his decision. And he turned his, the power of choice led him to keep his money. And money is a trap. It's a bigger trap than anything. <clears throat> I think it's about the far greatest trap because the Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil. And I think that pretty well settles the question. So all right now, later on as he gets old, he's very successful. And he adds farm to farm and land to land. He makes more and bigger granaries. And he got bigger, bigger crops and bigger, bigger everything, you know. <clears throat> like, uh, you know how it is. The Texaco is buying out. What's he buying out? Getty or somebody. And, and we got now somebody buying out United Steel and somebody buying out Beatrice. And the Supreme Court is listening to it. When if Mr. Reagan's a Christian, he ought to know the Bible's against joining land to land. So this, this nation is doomed. The man that's supposed to be a Christian and members like Hall and all these guys screaming about being Christians... And don't know that why they wouldn't know God made them in their porridge. That's an old Scotch saying. I'm not Scotch, but I accept the Scotch. So <clears throat> it's all right. They wouldn't know. See, there's just there's just nothing to it. So this rich young ruler got bigger and bigger crops and more and more lands joined together. <clears throat> and he said, one day, he said, I think I'll retire. He said, sold as much good laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. Take thine ease and have a great time. And out of heaven thundered a voice saying, this night thy soul is required of thee. Well, what good did they do? You see, now, I realize there's lots of things in life that are pertinent to us. And the Bible tells us that everybody, every male especially, has got to have a job. Especially if he's married, he's got to supply for his family. He's obligated. And it said a man that doesn't take care of his family is worse than a heathen. Now, that's what the Bible said. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. Well, they don't believe that for nothing. But that's the Bible. Amen. Now, you know, it comes a great promise out of that. There's a judgment verse, there's a promise. Now remember, God has got us as his family. Then God is obligated to supply his jobs if we want jobs. So I don't know if that works. Well, then you talk to God about it. I've seen it work. <clears throat> it does work. See, there's, uh, so <clears throat> there's obligations in here, but that's part of the kingdom of God and searching it. See where, where true eternal life is. 
the word goes with it. You cannot bypass the word of God on one promise, because that one promise, as soon as you take it away from the word of God, then you've lost the word of God. Absolutely. The, every, every word of God lies within the framework of the Word of God. There isn't one verse that stands alone as to a private interpretation. It all goes together. <clears throat> that you can't even take out one word. Can't even add one word. Got to watch that word. That word's tremendous. Now, so if he is all there is to look forward to, then we would be a most foolish people not to accept it and cherish it. Now, that's the word in eternal life. Of course, we're coming together. And not only accept it, but you come to something greater than that. After you've got it, don't take it, lay it on the shelf. It is to put. It is to be put into use. Now, I've got to read the next paragraph with it. We'll talk about what it really means here. <clears throat> like going to the doctor to get medicine, and then set it upon the shelf. If you go to get the medicine, take the medicine. If there is disease bothering you, and this remedy is supposed to help you, you take what he gives you. Now, that's a, that's a very blunt statement there about even Christians, if they go to a doctor, <clears throat> and you've got to trust them many times. Uh, that's what Brother Branham said. If you go there for medicine, you've got to trust him, and doctors are a god. I don't think every doctor is a god any more than every preacher is a god. But doctors are the institution is of god the same as preachers are an institution of god. And uh, they're, they're there for a purpose. Now he said, you've got to have faith. <clears throat> you believe what he gives you, you take it. And sometimes, just a few minutes, makes a lot of difference in the way you give it, or the way he gave it to you, of course. <clears throat> now, this sermon we've already read. I know and heard it, each one of you here. And so, therefore, we know what's in this message in a, in a way uh, already. And you'll notice that Brother Branham brings out later on about the blood shed must be applied. And so this is looking at it. <clears throat> Don't just know that there is a salvation. Don't just know there is a way for God to receive you by the blood. Don't just know that there is such a thing as the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And many people deny that. <clears throat> but is to lay hold of it. Well, that's what he's telling you here. Lay hold of the things of God. The promises, all these things in there. This would be known as the obedience of faith, where it says, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost, then walk in the light. See? Just the same as it says concerning any promise. How do we know, <clears throat> but in this case today, just one moment of your decision might determine your eternal destination. Take it just as he hands it to you. Now he's speaking to an audience. And the reason he's using this language is he knows that many people are not baptized with the Holy Ghost. So knowing that <clears throat> they're listening to what he's saying, there'll be many who will accept what he is saying. If not everybody, there'll be many. And out of that many, there'll be there who are not full of the Holy Ghost. So he's telling them, look, this is the time you can make your decision, and some of you will make a decision you will believe and be baptized with the Holy Ghost or you'll go down another road. <clears throat> now he said just how quickly you can do that. One moment takes care of an entire lifetime, takes care of an eternity. And he said take it as he hands it to you. <clears throat> now Brother Brown standing as a prophet of God was literally handing to them, not that he could give anybody the Holy Ghost. Any more than Peter could... Heal the crippled man at the, at the gate beautiful. But being the emissaries of God and using the word of God and being genuine seed, <clears throat> genuine ministers, and those ministers have fantastic power. Amen. I know a lot of people don't believe that, but hold your thought. Let's go to 2 Corinthians <clears throat> and just take the picture here. And we go into that fourth chapter. Well, we read the 18th verse first of all, third. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now, Paul's not veiled with anything anymore, but the word of God and the glory of God. Are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. <clears throat> now, Paul let the people know right there 
that he was doing business for God in the unveiling of people from a wrong interpretation of the word and thereby superimposing upon them and transferring to them. Through the power of the word and the office given him, God moving. And they come out in the image of God. <clears throat> now someone says, well, just a minute. I'm just a minute, not for one minute with me. I've stood too many times. The Pope and said, I'm just out of a blue sky. You'll not leave this building changed. Someone will not leave this building. Lives have been completely changed and turned around. I got no more to do with that than nothing. I'm not even, I'm not a prophet. I'm not even a good teacher, very poor teacher, but I ramble around until maybe somebody gets a little bit of help. But these are, these are all in ministries. <clears throat> See? And so Brother Brandon says, your destination can hang in this service this morning that I am conducting. Because he's a true representative, a delegate, <clears throat> a legate, an ambassador in the stead of Jesus Christ. And also in a manner that super, that, that, that passes what you and I have, though we in a lesser degree uh, fulfill that very requisite. A token. The blood shall be to you a token. Now, what is first the token? It is a word that is commonly used amongst us English-speaking people especially here in America. A token is, really, the dictionary says a token is a sign. For example, it is a sign of a fare that has already been paid. <clears throat> the fare or the price, as required price, that has been paid, like a fare in a railroad or a fare in a bus line. They give you a ticket, you see, for a token. Usually tokens are more like subways and trams and, you know, things like that. The more uh, common means of transportation. You go in and purchase your fare, and then they give you a token. And that token cannot be spent for anything else but to that railroad line or to ride on that railroad line. It is a token to the railway company that you have paid your fare. <clears throat> or you paid your fare to the railway company the cost to get a token, which allows you to get on the train. You drop it in a turnstile and you go right on in. It's a token. And you cannot spend it for anything else. It doesn't work on any other line. It just works on that line only, and it is a token. <clears throat> now, since Brother Brandon went to the dictionary, I'm not, not trying to upstage him now, but I went to my dictionaries, about 12 volumes or whatever they are there. And so here's a token. This is going to be interesting, token. And I won't read all the little funny things they put at the top here. One, something intended or supposed to represent or indicate another thing or an event. Now you get that. I'll read it again. That's very good. Something intended or supposed to represent or indicate another thing or an event. In other words, it's not the thing itself, but it's there instead of it. Representing it. <clears throat> Standing for it. Meaning that. And if you got the one, <clears throat> you will be able to get the other that this represents. Okay. <clears throat> okay. A sign, a symbol, and evidence. Okay, number two. A characteristic mark or indication. Three. A memorial of friendship. I like that. He's talking about the Holy Ghost, you know, really, when getting right down to it. He said, I call you friends. I'm not going to leave you friendless, he said, or without a with that, I'm not going to leave you orphans. Huh? <clears throat> Something by which the friendship or affection of another person is to be kept in mind. If you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much shall your heavenly Father, who really knows all about love and his love, will give you the Holy Ghost? Amen. See? A keepsake, a souvenir, a love gift. Four, something that serves as a pledge of authenticity, good faith, or the like, a witness, a signal. And you got scripture for this. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he. Signal. Six, a piece of metal having the general appearance of a coin and practically serving the same purpose. It differs from a coin in being worth much less than its nominal value, 
and is being issued as a rule by private persons without governmental sanction as a guarantee that the issuer will on demand redeem the token for its full nominal value in the legal currency of the country. What country does the token come from? So what you get here is what I might call the the uh, <clears throat> modicum, the uh, just the teeny drop, which is the Holy Spirit token. That represents everything, like the drop of water would represent the entire oceans of the world, and they're all yours. Tokens have generally been issued by tradesmen to provide a convenient small change when there was an absence or scarcity of the government coinage of the smaller denominations of money. So, all right, we have our token, the baptism, until he gets here. Come on, you are you thinking tonight? I, I, not your silence doesn't mean you're not thinking, but I hope your mind's going like mine now. So you're really catching what we're driving at here. Justification, sanctification, gives way to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost gives way to the Holy Ghost himself. One in a million, Phoenix, Masterpiece, Jeffersonville, Leaden tokens, now very scarce, were issued by tradesmen under Elizabeth and James I. In 1613 took the place, took the took place the issue, in 1613 took place the issue of Harrington tokens during the Commonwealth and so on. And all tavern keepers in nearly all England towns issued brass and copper tokens. Generally inscribed with the name address and traded the issuer at the nominal value, usually a pence, a tuppence, or or I guess that's a and a quarter, whatever those are. I don't know what that means. These specimens are known to collectors as the 17th century tokens, <clears throat> the 18th century tokens, and so on. And then right down the line. Then, then even the, the churches have them. And uh, right down the line, there's token, 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 token. Just many, 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 many uses. <clears throat> but you can see now, <clears throat> with that in mind, and it's on the tape so you can copy it off if you want it, or even run it off the, on the duplicator upstairs, uh, you can see why Brother Branham used the dictionary. And uh, his de definition is extraordinarily good. And this one is even uh, more complete <clears throat> to give you insights uh, that are perfect from the Word of God as he taught us. All right. Now, down here that we're speaking of, where we're standing in, is God saying to Israel, the blood of the Lamb is a token for you. The blood's a token. <clears throat> now notice, the blood then is a symbol only, for it does not represent itself, nor stand there for itself. It's a symbol of representing <clears throat> as a sign that a life has been taken. <clears throat> That's what the token says. The token says a life has been taken. Now, Israel lamb slain was Jehovah's required token. Now, just a minute. Is the language perfectly correct? Well, yes and no. The language is correct, but let's look at it this way. Did God have to see the lamb, or did he have to see the blood? He had to see the blood. So therefore the lamb slain provided Jehovah's required token. But the lamb itself was not <clears throat> the required token. But without the lamb there wouldn't be a token. So you do wrap them together and it's, fi it's feasible, it's very fine to put it that way. But notice his next sentence, it must be the blood. So what's he really saying? God required a lamb to be slain. Amen. And the blood of the lamb was the token. God made a token and gave it to Israel and no other token will work. See, it cannot be recognized. <clears throat> now watch. God furnished the token because he provided the lamb. Like Abraham said, God will provide a lamb. So all of grace, God does the providing, God does the giving. Now, no other token can, can be recognized. No matter what a person wants to present in that hour, there's no way any token can be recognized. Just that one, that alone. <clears throat> now, to the world, it is a bunch of foolishness. That's right. To the Greeks, foolishness. To the Gentiles. 
Maybe they don't want it. But to God, it's the only way, without the shedding of blood, nor remission of sin. The only thing that he requires is that token. It must be there. And you cannot have the token until the fair, that's the price, is paid. <clears throat> now, just a minute. That's fine if you're going to go and get a ticket <clears throat> or a token to drop in the turnstile to get on the bus or the tram. You pay it. But when you want to get on God's heavenly railway, there's no way that you can buy that token. That token has already been purchased. My brother Brandon says, no way to get on unless this token has been purchased. No way for anybody <clears throat> to get into paradise unless the purchase price has been paid. And doesn't say you paid it either. I tell you that if Israel didn't pay a price, the lamb paid the price. Remember, Jesus did not inherit the bride. He earned the bride. What he inherited was the name. Father's got the same name as the son. <clears throat> then you are a possessor of the token, which gives you the privilege, now watch it, of a free pass. Now, if you paid the price of a token, you didn't get a free pass. But if somebody else paid the price, you got a free pass. And remember, was it Feldman, or I think his name's Fel Feldman, the, the, the great economist that bought the best we got. I think that's his name. He said there's no such thing as a free lunch. Someone's got to pay for it. Amen. And there's no such thing as a free pass. Somebody had to pay for it. But it's free to you and me. In other words, put it this way. As the scripture, come without money and without price and buy. <clears throat> so I see the scripture lying beautifully, just even the way the prophet put it. All right. When I see, I'll see the blood, I'll pass over you. What a time. What a privilege to know that you pack within you the past. Well, he's talking to you and me, not referring to Israel back there. <clears throat> when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Blood is on the outside. It is the only thing you will recognize. There is nothing else can take its place. No substitute. No denomination. No anything else. It takes that. The token. God said, that alone will I see. No matter how righteous they were, how good they were, how much education they had, how they dressed, the token was the only thing. <clears throat> when I see the token, I'll pass over you. That's the one sign that God looked for because that's the one sign that proved evidentially <clears throat> that the blood had been shed and they were taking it. The blood was the token. The blood was a token, actually, in this case, the proof that the requirement of Jehovah had been met. What was the requirement? Take a lamb, kill it, sprinkle the blood. That it had been done. The blood stood for the token. No, the blood did not stand for the token. The blood was the token. Notice how he corrects it. The blood was the token. See? No matter if the man just made a little teeny slip in there or <clears throat> a little bit hazy, God always brought him right back. <clears throat> so, the blood was the token. The life that God had said, the day you eat thereof, that day you die. And there had been a substitutionary life taken for the life of the believer. God in mercy accepted a substitute for the life of the defiled person. <clears throat> See? So the token showed that the sinner accepted God's substitute. That's what it did. You got a substitute. So therefore, how can you die? When his child had defiled himself with sin of disbelieving, the word then God, rich in mercy, made a substitute. <clears throat> and that was something had to die in his place. Nothing else could work. See, now remember, all sin is unbelief. So the antidote is renewed faith. They had to come back to faith. And it had to be faith in the blood. And notice that Cain came to the hour when he had to make his decision and the blood was there and had been accepted to God and he tried another token, it wouldn't work. And he rebelled and killed his brother. <clears throat> and literally blasphemed God. See that? you got to watch that decision. That is why Cain's apples, peaches and so forth didn't work. It had to be a life that had blood in it. 
and the life was gone from the sacrifice, and the blood was a token. That's God's order, that God's order had been carried out. Remember, his first order was, don't eat or you die. Now, they disobeyed in unbelief. Eve did. And you know something? That God didn't say to Eve, now, do you believe if I'm going to make a sacrifice, will you go ahead and make one? He didn't do what she didn't do one thing that way. He made the sacrifice for her and Adam. And you know what? <clears throat> because they were children of God, they did accept it. <clears throat> they dressed themselves in the skins of the very blood that the animals were shed. And that you can't get anything nicer than sheepskin. <clears throat> now, what did God require? The life. The blood showed that there had to be a life gone. So the blood was the token that the life had been given. And that's a perfect definition right there. That something had died. God's requirement that a life had been given, and the blood had been shed, and the blood was the token that the life was gone. For the token stood and, and, and brought forth the fact that the blood was gone, because you wouldn't have that blood unless the uh, life was gone. The, the life of the animal <clears throat> uh, that God has spoken of <clears throat> should be taken. It was sacrificed. The blood was then the token. The believing worshiper was identified with his sacrifice by the token. <clears throat> I'm going to skip over here to page 12 and paragraph 8. The blood was shed at Calvary, that is true. But the blood, as far as this, went back into the elements from which it came from the food that he lived on. <clears throat> that was fine for Israel. But remember, this is only an illustration of this hour, the token applied, only those going in will be full of the Holy Ghost. Okay? <clears throat> the believing worshippers identified with his sacrifice by the token. So are we by our token. Now, I don't wish to stay too long in these little quotations, which could take the entire service on one of them. But I want to stop here a moment to express that the believer had to be identified with his sacrifice. Now, that's good. <clears throat> now, see what he's doing? He's taking blood token, now going to sacrifice. And you cannot have blood without identification. If you don't identify, and there's only one identification, <clears throat> that's when God's in you. He identified with you. See? Now, if it just a sacrifice and made somewhere out there, he gave it, but it had to be identified in it. Frankly, he had to place his hands on the sacrifice first to identify himself with that sacrifice. And then the blood was placed to where he could stand under the blood. The blood must be over him. And that was the token that he identified himself guilty and proven that an innocent substitute had taken his place. What a beautiful picture. Oh, redemption seat. Justice had been met, and the requirement of God's holy justice had been met, and God said, <clears throat> now I require your life. <clears throat> That's what he said when justice was meted up because the man and woman sinned. But now there's a sacrifice, so they're free. Now, they die physically, but they're going to come back. Then when the life had sinned, then an innocent substitute took its place. It was a blood beast, not apple or peach. That ought to absolutely make the serpent seed so plain to everybody. It was blood. And this blood, which could not come out of fruit, came out of an innocent substitute. <clears throat> the life had gone out of his place, and the blood was a symbol that the beast had died, and the blood was gone out. The worshiper applying the blood over himself showed that he was identified in the redemption because he was identifying himself with the sacrifice, connecting himself to the sacrifice, and the blood stood as the token. How wonderful. What a picture it is. It is a perfect type of Christ just exactly. The believer today, standing under the shed blood, identified with the sacrifice, <clears throat> just as perfect as it can be. And how did Christ not be an animal? You see the animal die. But it was the most innocent thing we have, I suppose, would be the animal of the lamb. When God wanted to identify Jesus Christ, he identified him as a lamb. And when he wanted to identify himself, he identified himself as a bird, a dove. And the dove is the most innocent and cleanest of all bird life. And the lamb is the most innocent and pure of all animal life. Now, there's <clears throat> a couple of sermons where Brother Brown said, uh, lamb led by a dove and on the wings of a snow white dove brings this out very clear. So, you see, when Jesus was baptized by John, and the Bible said, and he saw the Spirit of God like a dove coming down upon him. 
the dove descended on the lamb. That's, that's the truth. Behold the lamb of God. He saw the spirit coming down like a dove, a, a dove of fire. <clears throat> Therefore, if it had been a wolf, or if it had been another animal, the nature of the dove could not have blended with the nature of the wolf. How can how can any how can serpent seed or reprobate ever get the Holy Ghost? Amen. If a person wasn't foreknown in the election and then coming down through predestination, there'd be no way. <clears throat> there'd be no way. That's why you got Matthew 7 with many coming up in that day and claiming many gifts where they're anointed, but they're not full of the Holy Ghost. Neither could the nature of the dove blend with, blend with any other animal but the lamb. And those two natures came together. Then they could agree with each other. <clears throat> How can two walk together, live together, except to be agreed? My brother Brown said, if you didn't have representation back there, you don't have it now. If you weren't in him back there, you're not in him now. That's true. That's simply the word of God. There again, of course, it's a matter of put up and shut up. People say, well, why, 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 don't, don't tell me God would do that. Well, don't you tell me God wouldn't do it. Because he said he would. <clears throat> you know, the evidence is against the carnal thinker. The Bible warns you, you'll never figure this book by your own carnality. you got to, first of all, as Brother Ben said, take it flat the way it is. God's his own interpreter. He doesn't need any interpreter. It means just what it says and says what it means. But man always wants to get his head in there. <clears throat> and of course, it never worked for the poor guy that just sticks his head in there. It won't work. See, they could not, they, then they could agree with each other. Now do you see predestination? It was a lamb when he came here, see? See, it was a lamb when it was brought. It was a lamb. It was born a lamb. It was raised up a lamb. <clears throat> All we like sheep had gone astray. The great sheep did not go astray. The great sheep died for all sheep. See? But you know something? There's going to come a time when they're going to scream, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Whoever saw a lamb mad, well, he will be in. <clears throat> Full of wrath. <clears throat> See? Right now, he's the judge which came to avenge. Next step, the judge revenge. See? Okay? Therefore, that is the only kind of a true spirit that can receive the word, that can receive Christ. The rest of them will try. They try to get it and put the spirit of God upon a wolf. See, angered, ill, mean, won't stay there. Holy Spirit flies right away. He will not do it. <clears throat> Brother Branham said, <clears throat> went so far as to say that even a person that's predestinated cannot receive the Holy Spirit the way he is. God gives him another spirit, puts a new spirit in him, then the Holy Spirit can come to him. What if that dove had come down instead of being a lamb? There would have been some other animal. It would have quickly taken its flight and gone back. And when it found that nature that it could blend into, it just became one. And then the dove led the lamb. And notice, it led the lamb to the slaughter. But it had to. Because there's only one recourse, that's blood. <clears throat> now the lamb was obedient to the dove. See, no matter where it led, it was willing to go. I wonder today when God leads us to a life of complete surrender and service to him, I wonder if our spirits then sometimes don't rebel, kind of showing that, wonder if we are lambs. See, <clears throat> well, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's got to be God in you, willing and doing you, his own good service and pleasure, Amen. or it isn't accepted anyway. There's got to be a takeover. A lamb is obedient. A lamb is self-sacrificial. Doesn't claim its own. You can lay it right down and share the wool off it. The only thing it's got to give. Never says anything about it. Just sacrifices everything it's got. That is the lamb. Gives everything away. Itself and all that it is. That is the way a real Christian is. They're self-sacrificial themselves. Caring nothing for this world, but giving all they've got to God. <clears throat> now, the question would come up then, is this the evidence of the Holy Ghost? Is this the rebirth? Well, let's just read Broken Sisters. I'm going to take Broken Sisters, page 13 and paragraph 17. I said the most perfect evidence, for 67 I guess it is, the most perfect evidence I can think of is love. Because that was the question I was asking him <clears throat> on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So we got to talking on that, and then I thought that sounded pretty good, so I just held that. If a man's got love. But one day the Lord in a vision straightened me out. And he said that the evidence of the Spirit was those who could receive the word. Neither love nor speaking in tongues, but it's receiving the word. Now, that doesn't say that the gifts are on the shelf and gone. That doesn't say that you throw out love. It doesn't say you throw any of those things out. It just says 
The evidence is receiving the word and believing it for that hour. <clears throat> so don't think of something else while we read this. Okay, turn it over. Now, continuing. Now, this was a perfect lamb, Christ was. Okay, that's over in Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Two portions of scripture we'll take a look at here. And I guess they're verse 7. He was oppressed, verse 7, 8. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He had he opened not his mouth, he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a shearer before her shearers are dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And <clears throat> with that, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 12. That's that chapter there. And it's just two verses again, five and six. And your lamb shall be without blemish, and made of the first year, and you shall take it out of the sheep, from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. <clears throat> now what do we read those two for? Because the trial of Jesus Christ and the flaying and all, and the keeping him there at the judgment, was to see that he was a proper lamb and the fulfillment of all scripture, which he most certainly was. And he proved that he was the Christ, the Messiah, and yet he died for the sins of the people, and he worked their redemption by the course that God had set, even from the Garden of Eden, and from eternity, actually, because he was the Lamb crucified before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> now, and then through the shed, shedding, the shed, the shed blood of this Lamb, the natural Lamb in Egypt, the blood was applied. And when it was, it became a token. Then what would the blood of this lamb stand for? The token that we are dead to ourselves and identified with our sacrifice. Then the lamb and the blood and the person becomes identified together. The sacrifice and the believer. <clears throat> Such as it says, nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross I cling. Or as it says in Romans 10 and 1, Israel going about to uh, work out its own righteousness, did not submit itself to the righteousness of God. They had none of their own. All our righteousnesses are our filthy rags. <clears throat> Actually, it's not simply the lamb, the blood, and the person. But it is really this. It is the lamb, the blood, and the lamb life, and the believer, wherefore makes perfect deliverance. Because if you just had in there, which is true, because he's already counting, <clears throat> that is uh, as understood. But if you just said the blood and the person becomes identified together, the sacrifice and the believer, that's very true in there. But the actual token of this hour is the light has to come upon us. Amen. So therefore you have Jesus and <clears throat> you have the bloodshed and you have the life from the blood and you have the believer. So you come up with the four, which is perfectly legitimate <clears throat> according to Brother Branham's numerology, uh, numerics. And you are identified in your life by your sacrifice. In other words, you've got the same kind of life. You've got the same kind of love, proving that you have the true sacrifice, and you've got the true spirit of that sacrifice. See? <clears throat> that makes you what you are. Then the blood was a token of identification. That's right. That was the token. See, the blood was. The blood identified that the worshiper had slain the lamb and accepted the lamb and applied the token to himself, that he was not ashamed. He didn't care who saw it. He wanted everybody to see it and was placed in such a position that every pass, buddy passing by <clears throat> could see that token. Now the word of God distinctly says in Acts 1 and 8 that there to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So there, this is perfectly right. There to be witnesses when they have the token. Not before they have the token, but after the token <clears throat> they become witnesses of a great and high caliber. See, many people want to be Christian, and they like to do it secretly, so nobody knows that they are Christians. And the associates they run around with, some of them would think, well, now look, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to be so-and-so to know about it. Well, that's very true, but what about the folk that claim they're Christian, especially some of these great sportsmen? They claim they're born again. How much born again are they? No more than nothing. <clears throat> well, they'll claim it. But you watch their lives. I think
think maybe they might claim it to add respectability to their sins. That's a little bit something like the, the jewel in the, in the, in the swine, in the snout of a swine. <clears throat> not too great. Now, well, now, you see, that is not Christianity. Christianity has to display its token publicly in public life at the office, on the street, when trouble's around, anything in the church, everywhere else. Well, certainly because it, it's a light, and you got it, it's, it's going to show. The blood is the token, and the token must be applied. Now, using that as illustration all the time to bring us to this hour, they had, the blood was there, they had to apply it. The blood was there, they had to apply it. It wasn't their blood, it was a sacrifice blood. They had to apply it. <clears throat> it had to be visible. And it would be visible, naturally be visible, if you applied it. Application is the way God said to do it. Application is not some other way. What if they to put it on the, on the, on the uh, what do you call it, not the lintels and doorposts, but put it on the threshold? <clears throat> Wouldn't work. Can't trample it. See, they put it on the two uprights and above. There you are, completely caged. Complete protection. Amen. And if you want to know the truth, the good shepherd lies right along at the door of you. He becomes the door of the sheepfold. See, the blood is the token. The blood must be applied. Or even the covenant is not in effect. <clears throat> That's true. No covenant. People can scream covenant all they want. The blood was a token or an identification identifying this person has been redeemed. Now that's very good right there. <clears throat> it is an identification. It shows that the believer was in a covenant contract with God. Now, that covenant contract, uh, I don't know if I can find that or not because I'm just not too good at going to Hebrews and pulling it right out where I want it. <clears throat> Might be around chapter 6, I don't know. Yeah. Here it is. And when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I'll bless thee, and multiplying I'll multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now what did Abraham have to do? Just wait for what God had promised. Abraham entered the covenant, which God said, I will do it all, I will see to it all. And he did. <clears throat> Notice that God swore by himself. We'll get more of that down the road when Brother Branham tells how safe this token makes you. Now, they were redeemed before there was anything that ever happened. Now listen carefully. They were redeemed before there was anything that ever happened. By faith, they applied the blood. Before it actually happened, the blood was applied by faith, believing it was going to happen. <clears throat> now that sounds a little bit abstract, doesn't it? Rob Tucson there. But maybe it's not so bad. Uh, 11 and 4 of Hebrews. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. See? God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, <coughs> yet speaketh. Now, it said by faith he applied the blood <coughs> before anything actually happened, which was according to contract. They applied that blood, and God gave them the perfect safety. Now we got the same thing right today. Before the wrath of God passed through the land, the blood had to be applied first. It was too late after the wrath had fallen. It would be too late when the Great Tribulation comes. <clears throat> Look, you've got the same thing over here. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, where it said, The Lord will descend from the shout, and they'll be caught up. And uh, it said, But the times and seasons, brethren, we have no need to write unto you. You know perfectly that day of the Lord, so comes the thief tonight. They say, peace and safety, sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon only the child. They should not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you to thee. <clears throat> so he tells you right there that the bride is going to be taken out of here. She'll be in the light. Remember, Israel had light in Goshen when all other light was darkened. There was no light but what Israel had. <clears throat> We're in the darkest ages of all. And, but we do have the true light. Amen. And remember, one glimmer of true light is worth a billion glares. Amen. See, that's right. We're living in the globe, not a glare. <clears throat> now, God's church was safe back there from death, safe from destruction. Egypt got destroyed. So will it be in this hour. The bride will be gone, and the tribulation will set in. 
Now, we have a lesson there that we could maybe bring it to your thought in just a moment. See, look, before it happened, for there is coming a time that you'll not be able to have any blood applied. <clears throat> now, that time is setting in. This is something he mentioned in the seals. And, of course, people got excited and thought, well, the blood's off the mercy seat. It's all over this, that. And yet in souls that are now in prison, Brother Branham brought out that the day was coming when the temple was filled with smoke and then it was all over. Remember, redemption still comes to the 144,000. But as far as the Gentiles are concerned, it'll be just as though there is no blood. Why? It wasn't, it wasn't applied. <clears throat> what wasn't applied? The token. The Holy Spirit, see? <clears throat> so, listen, the Word of God, brother, sisters, as I said a while ago, goes together in continuity. You cannot take one verse of Scripture. Like, look at John 3, 16 is almost a blasphemy in the face of God. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Who's there believing that you're not uh, uh, <clears throat> perish everlasting life? He laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. And you get a proof text salvation where the preacher says to the sinner, well, he said, now look, you know you're a sinner. Well, I don't know if I am. Well, you know that you've stolen and lied and done some bad things. Yeah, well, you're a sinner. Yes, I'm a sinner. Well, now the Bible distinctly says, you've got sin on you. Well, I guess that's true. I've got sin on me. Now the Bible says here that he laid all the world, of, all the sin of all the world upon him. So therefore, he laid your sin in Zary. Yeah, that's right too. Then if he laid your sin on him, then you haven't got any sin. Oh, that's right. Shake my hand. Bless God, you're saved. That all sounds good. And if the Holy Ghost was behind it, that's great. Come on, you know that's not right. <clears throat> Proof text salvation. <clears throat> he got a name for everything. That wasn't the name I'd call it. I'd call it corruption. <laughs> but it's still proof text salvation. That's the way they want it, see? All right. The lamb was killed in the evening time after being kept up 14 days. Then the lamb was killed. And the blood was applied in the evening time. You get it? All right? <clears throat> now, this is an example of looking at the token in this hour. And remember, it was at the evening time. See? That's what we're looking at. All right. The token never came into existence until the evening time. And this is the evening time of the age we live in. This is the evening time for the church. This is evening time for me. This is evening time of message. I'm dying. I'm going. <clears throat> I'm moving out <clears throat> into the evening time gospel. Now, just in getting ahead of it. Page 11, paragraph 6. There came from the body of our Lord Jesus Christ water, blood, and light. And the whole church, the bride together. Now notice, the whole church, the bride together has been made up to justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> which is the token. These all wandered on sheepskin and goatskin were destitute. All these things that they did, yet were not made perfect without us. And the church in this day has received the token of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that the blood has been shed and the Holy Ghost is upon the church. He didn't say upon each individual, in each individual, he said upon the church. And the Holy Ghost can, would never be upon any church that wasn't already seen. Amen. Because the token, the, lamp, the, the dove does not come upon a wolf. And he's talking now of the church. doesn't talk of individuals. <clears throat> See? Putting it there. So we've got to watch carefully some of the things he's saying and try to place them just the way he's putting them forward to us. We've come up through justification and so forth. But this is a time that the token has to be applied. I told you last Sunday, it's something I wanted to talk to you about. This, this, this is it. The time when you just can't play with it. It has got to be done. If it is ever going to be done, it's got to be done now. Because we can see that the wrath is about ready to pass through the land <clears throat> and everything from under the token will perish. The blood, is, the blood has identified you. <clears throat> now, if I got this here. desperation. Now, you people in the tapes in there this morning, the message this morning was to me the highlight message of my entire ministry. That's the token like we're reading here. The highlight ministry, message of my entire ministry. Someday I'll tell you how it came about. And I know that everything has worked for months and months up to that one message moving up to come to that place. 
And, and that was the capping off time of it. <clears throat> That's very strange. Why would a man spend all years preaching a sermon he should have preached at the beginning? Because how are you going to get a message and how are you going to understand anything if you don't have the Holy Ghost to understand it with? Amen. You must have the cart behind the, before the horse unless he's talking to something that, that people don't really think know he's talking about. How can the Holy Ghost cap off when, bless God, that's, that's your start? You only come into Christ by being baptized with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> There's something in here that that a Pentecostal and a fundamental mind is not going to get a hold of. Otherwise, the prophet is something he hasn't got a hold of. And I can't believe that. <clears throat> can't believe that for one minute. I saw too much. Now, I'm sure hope that you got what the token meant. See, the token is a sign that the blood has been applied and the price has been asked required to God. Jesus paid that price by shedding his own blood. He did that. Then from his life came the Holy Spirit. And when the blood is applied to you, the Holy Spirit is the token that your price is paid. God has received you, and that's a token. Remember, that's a token. It's taught me individually right there. Now, there's many people who don't. They don't know what the token is, what that token is. And you have to make it like nobody knows it, see? So that all of them will get it. Just like preaching salvation. We have to preach salvation the way that everybody is for everybody, <clears throat> which we know it isn't. We have to preach divine healing for everybody. Yet we know it isn't. See? Jesus came to save those who are in the book of redemption before the foundation of the world. He came only to save those. Who are they? I don't know. See? But you. Nobody can have faith unless you say it's for whosoever. And it is. Nobody can come unless God's called them. That's true. Though there's many people who won't be saved. We know that. God knew that before the word began. Wouldn't be saved. Many won't be healed. See? Many won't be healed. They just can't grasp it. They don't know what it is. Many will be. But we preach this for everybody. Because we don't know who that person is. We just don't know. But that is whosoever. Some people just can't grasp that faith. <clears throat> now that's the same thing about this token. The token we have taught. The token. We have talked to the token all the way along. But now see. It is manifestation of the token. <clears throat> not just not baptism the Holy Ghost. It's a manifesting time. What's been going on all along? Members being baptized into Jesus Christ and the great baptizer himself. See? Now it's manifestation of the holy of the token. Now we have sometimes allowed it. The Lutherans allowed it, accepting the word, accepting Christ as personal Savior. In other words, that was the measure of the word, the measure of the spirit. They were born again. <clears throat> the Methodist said, when you get happy, enough to shout, that's it. Pentecost says, speak in tongues, you got it. And we find out that all of it was wrong, see? The token is the token. Now apply it yourself. It's you and Christ as persons together, see? It's the Holy Spirit. His life in you working, his own life through you. And it's for the rich, the poor, who serve him. You see, he's not gifts. The Holy Spirit has gifts, but he's not gifts. <clears throat> he's a person. He's a life. Individually. For everyone, if you're born again. See? Now remember what the token is. You go to the railway company, you buy your fare. There's a price, cost 50 cents to ride. This bus line or railway to Charleston, Indiana costs 50 cents. Well, now the company puts out tokens, see? Now the thing you do, you go down, someone purchases your fare 50 cents. They give you a token that gives you the right on that train to the destination where the train goes, see? That's a token. Now in this case, the blood was the token. Literally, it had to be applied because it was just the chemistry. It's all that they had because of lamb's blood and an animal, lamb's blood. <clears throat> so the light that was in the blood... The life was gone out, so the blood was shed, see? The life went out, but it couldn't come back on the believer because it was the animal. And that's back in this day, Moses' day. But it only spoke of a good conscience that there was a coming one, a perfect sacrifice. And to make it a perfect one, the whole judge, the God of heaven, became the sacrifice, judge, jury, and attorney, see? <clears throat> he became the sacrifice. And then when his life went out, which was God, and the word there, where it comes, I'll give them eternal life. Now, in the Greek, I'm talking scholars, see? The word in the Greek is Zoe. means God's own life. It does in that respect. And I'll give unto him Zoe, my own life. Christ and God was one, true. And when the life that was in Christ is the Holy Ghost, not the third person, but the same person in the form of the Holy Spirit, coming, coming upon you as a token, that your life and your fare is paid, you've been accepted. Until that token comes, you're not permitted in the highway. 
you're not permitted the bus line. You're not permitted until you present the token, and that token is your fare. Now it shows the blood has been shed, been applied to you, the price has been applied to you, <clears throat> and you have taken the token, the blood is applied to you, and you're accepted. Get it now? Now, no certain evidence, see? You say, Brother Branham, I feel in your mind, you see. Why will I know? Look. In other words, he knows they're thinking, I've got to have an evidence. Now he said, look, look, what were you? And what are you? There's how you know, see? What were you before this token was applied? What are you after it's applied? What are your, were your desires before? What are your desires after? Then you know whether the token's applied or not. <clears throat> These other things just automatically go with that, see? <clears throat> now remember, that's, that's not the evidence of the baptism with the Holy Ghost. No way. This was preached at a different time. <clears throat> like talking about and say tongues is the evidence. Now I'll buy a pair of shoes, the tongue, the tongue isn't the shoe. It just comes with the shoe. See? Now the same thing as the token. The token is Christ. But speaking in tongues, casting out devils, doing these things, preaching, whatever it is, is it is it's it's true, it's there. See? But it's not the evidence, and it's not the Holy Spirit. It's a gift of it. If I told you, I want you, Brother Branham, and I give you gifts, see, well, that's not me. That's my gift. See, Brother Branham says, I give you gift. The gift is not, I'm not the gift. I'm just giving you gift. <clears throat> Tongues is a gift of the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Ghost. A gift of the Holy Ghost. The devil can impersonate any of these things, but he cannot be the Holy Ghost, see? He can impersonate those gifts, but he can't be the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is the token that the blood has been applied. Because it follows the blood all the way from the book of redemption, see? That was the purpose of him coming. That's what he followed in every age. Every age he followed that to see that it's brought forth. See, every age God stood over that. Absolutely see it was brought forth. They could not be made perfect without us. Now, listen, the entire Holy Spirit visits the church, making God in human flesh as he did before Sodom, the burning there. And now he's telling you, Pat, I am the prophet of God. I am God's prophet. Amen. I am that word. Amen. <clears throat> you see the link up? The manifestation? It wasn't there before. Never came to this age. Right. But people were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now then, how can anybody be filled with the Holy Ghost and deny what the Holy Ghost himself in evidence has presented in this hour? <clears throat> See, it can't be done. And going right to the Word every single time and showing it. People say, well, I think that's too obscure. That's one man's idea. Is it when he's vindicated? Let them produce it. They can't do it, brother, sister. I'm going to tell you something. If this isn't it, we're a million miles ahead of anything else. You may have to shoot the last 10 miles you're in, but you're at least 100 miles ahead of the other guys behind you. Now, that's not going to happen, and you know I'm saying that. In other words, there's nothing to this other. <clears throat> then Abraham, he appeared to him. And all the things that he hasn't done down through the ages, in the church ages, he's doing now. That's not your baptism with the Holy Ghost. You didn't do that. I didn't do that. <clears throat> no way. There's your combination there. There's the king that judged the whole other. Evidential, strictly. Notice, all the things he hasn't done down through the ages, church, as he's doing now. Back to the Word. Because the messages and the messages and the messages has to wind up in the entire Word. And in the last days, the seven seals being opened was to pick up every straggle that's been left off in it and make the whole thing in one great big body of the bride. <clears throat> that's our part. That they who live back there we're not perfect until, until this church be perfected. Now they're completed and gone in the ground and their completion is over. We don't get that kind of completion appointed unto man wants to die. Right, amen. This age is appointed to immortality. The group that won't die. And unto them, the son of righteousness arises with healing in his wings. <clears throat> in the same way, that's immortality. And the same one that arose is the same one that brings forth the dead because he descended with a shout, <clears throat> which is a message, 
the voice, which is the head of the church to raise the dead, <clears throat> and the trumpet is the summoning the wedding supper, and he does all three in the form of the Holy Spirit until the church be perfect, the bride group in the last days, to bring them in and all together be taken up. All right, let's look at Scripture. He said, if I don't send Elijah, <clears throat> he said, I'll just come with the curse. Well, you take a look at that curse. I, I look at a little more than just the fact that, that every bride, every member would have to die and none reach immortality. I look at the fact and wonder, could the dead even rise at this time? I don't believe they could. Have to wait for the white throne. So there's perhaps a whole lot more to the depth of Scripture than we'd like to believe because we'd like to sort of oversimplify it for the sake of our traditions and somebody else. Well, you can't do it. The token Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, is among us. <clears throat> Why do you say it's in us? Both. 